The next day, you get focused on the task at hand. It's a sunny day in May, and your officers know that morale and discipline will quickly suffer if you don't do anything. So B Company, just like all the others, begins going through its paces. You stand to at an unholy hour in the morning. Then you drill, march, and draw some more, perfecting your ability to hold various parade formations whilst in groups of hundreds of soldiers. Runners scurry between the companies delivering messages to commanders in the field and to headquarters in the rear, where clerks receive and process the reports to assist the higher echelon officers with their decisions. Maybe we can quill the Germans with a parade, one of your friends jokes. Indeed, even during one of your training lectures, your instructor makes it a point to stress the importance of a good parade march. You also play some football. Some of the officers try to organize a rugby match, but most of your men aren't interested. There's also some efforts at cricket. You have a few men in your battalion who played at the county level, but the game's pace doesn't suit the hectic front lines. What, by the way, would you play if you were up if it were up to you? Darts, football, rugby, cricket, duck duck goose, something else. I kind of like rugby, so why not rugby? Football is what's played here. You get caught up in matches between platoons, companies, battalions, and even brigades. The most popular match is between the Black Cats, the nickname given to any team made up of players from the 12th Darham Light Infantry, and the Toon Army, which is the name decisively applied to a team from any other outfit. It's fun, you guess, but you're not actually too good. It's not just for fun, though. As your bookseller captain explains, the matches build a strong sense of camaraderie. Even more importantly, you hear him saying to a lieutenant one day, they help identify the outliners in our group, both good and bad. The competitors, the leaders, and the malcontents are all exposed. How's our stats, though? 45, 75, 45. Okay. Camaradi is also something that develops outside daytime drills and marches. There are thousands of you here, all camping out essentially, and you have lots of time to speculate about your future and to gossip about your colleagues. Chaplains and unqualified officers are particular butts of your jokes, with one private going so far as to claim there are more chaplains being treated in the infirmary for venereal disease than every other rank and office put together. That's not true, of course. Well, you assume it's, it simply cannot be true, but it's a funny thought nonetheless. Since most of you are young soldiers facing combat for the first time, you also devote a great deal of attention to what it will be like to fight the enemy in war. Perkins was just one of a multitude of people offering their opinions. You're relieved to learn that pretty much everyone is apprehensive. There's lots of chatter about death, and about being wounded, and about whether you show enough courage when the time comes. Some men want to get through this unscathed. Others think a well-placed injury, like a queen bullet wound in a non-lethal spot, would be perfect because it would get you out of fighting, but with your honor embellished. Some rationalize their chances, while others leave it up all to fate or to their god. A friend of yours from high school or from school, Edward, has gone so far as to calculate his odds. I figure one in four for everything, he tells you. One in four that you'll be killed. One in four that you'll pip a blight in one, that is, that you'll be wounded. One in four that you'll be captured, which is almost like going home. And one in four you'll get through safely. It's not ideal, he allows, but I can live with it. You're momentar you are momentarily angry that you have to calculate your chances of living like this. Hedford is a good man, you think. What has he done to deserve this? What right does society have to put you in this position? And for what? A week after you arrive, the B Company's lieutenants gather you and the other men together. You don't know what's going on, and at first some of the soldiers are nervous. There's one old fish private in your company named Jenkins, a bit simple-minded fellow and the others start teasing that he's finally been shadowed for execution. Don't worry, Jenkins, somebody jokes. It'll be a queen shot, and we won't pilfer your things until you're dead and buried in the ground. You're not sure Jenkins is entirely at ease with this, but the rest of you share a hearty laugh. 
The real reason for the assembly is to fill several specialty positions. The call goes out for volunteers to either machine gunners or runners. A machine gunner operates at a Lewis gun, the most efficient killing machine the infantry has. Runners, on the other hand, are tasked with carrying messages between commanders. Odd that they would be as asking for both, you think, though you don't even know that much about them. We've had some transfers and now we're short, the lieutenant says. Show of hands, man, if you're interested in either. We'll make our selection once we know the candidates. Well, that's a sudden. Stay a regular infantryman or apply for something different. And it looks as though if you want to try to switch, you'll have to do it publicly, in front of everyone, right now. What would Perkins tell you to do? What do you do? I'm gonna raise my hand. I've had enough time to figure out that, you know, going in the trenches and around them is a default suggestion, so let's raise my hand. You leap at the chance, even the potential, to distinguish yourself. Anything that sets you apart makes you important. You might get noticed, you might get promoted, and you might get protected. Who knows? But if you don't take the chance, then you'll never have the opportunity, and something like this might never come around again. When you raise your hand, your neighbors mumble ominously. Too good for honest work, eh, Calvin? asks Cook, who seems to enjoy needling you for no reason. Soon, though, there are almost 30 volunteers beside yourself, and the lieutenant thanks you all for your interest and dismisses the rest of the men. They march off and leave you and your group standing there silently to wonder what happens next. The lieutenant looks pleased. Always good to have volunteers, he says. You men should be commended for your enthusiasm. Then he calls to a sergeant, who sets up a Lewis machine gun on a sturdy tripod stand. As you can see, the lieutenant tells you all, this wonderful piece of martial handiwork does not fire itself. We have lost several of our gunners to your assignment to the 68th Battalion and must replenish our ranks. Gunners will be stationed at trench parapets and other exposed locations to provide covering fire for our men and to hold enemy advances in their tracks. Otherwise, our adventures in the trenches might not go as planned. That's a wild understatement, you think. Our other need, the lieutenant continues, is for additional runners assigned to brigade headquarters to hand deliver orders to commanders in the field. Coming from regular infantry, the duties will represent a notable change from what you are used to, so your ability to do new things will be important. The duty calls for men of the utmost physical conditioning who are resourceful enough to make it through wildly changing battlefield conditions and resilient enough to get there in one piece, or, he then adds with a smirk, in as few pieces as possible while still living. Wow. You take this in while the lieutenant finishes his explanation. In all likelihood, these will be short-term assignments. While I cannot go into great detail, suffice it to say we will should have the enemy on the run within a matter of days or weeks at the most. He will not be able to withstand our coming assault. Until then, however, we need runners and gunners. He pauses for a beat to smile at his own rhyme. They are not overlapping duties. Please volunteer for one or the other. Or for neither, if you have heard enough and would prefer to remain in your present posts. This is your right, and nothing you do here will be held against you in any way. What do you want to do? Try for a machine gun? where you would play an outsized role in the fighting, but would also be a special target, or be a runner where you would do less fighting and more running, again in situation where you might stand out, or stay with the known world of the combat infantryman. Well, that's interesting. I'm thinking we will try the runner. You know, the machine gun guys, they're special targets, so yeah, volunteer to be a runner. Calvin, sir, you say, volunteering for duty as a runner, if you please. To your dismay, the lieutenant immediately shakes his head. I'm sorry, Calvin, but I've seen you play at football. Your heart is in it, but your legs are not. You are a fine man, do not take this the wrong way, but you are not cut out to be a runner. I need men as dependable as Nelson at Trafalgar. One cannot tire, even for an instant. Well, you think that rejection was nothing if not quick. Though wasn't Nelson killed at Trafalgar, 
You're not sure the lieutenant compar lieutenant's comparison makes any sense. Perhaps, if you can understand your officer's point, you will really not cut out for his assignment. In any event, there is no opportunity to appeal. They've already moved on to the next man and you're left there almost as though you are no longer visible. You're left with your own thoughts while you wait for the other volunteers to be similarly accepted or rejected. Needless to say, you feel disappointed and a little embarrassed by what happened. You also catch sign of Cook trying to suppress a smile and your rejection. There's still a war going on though, so hopefully you can quickly put this little episode behind you and find other opportunities to play your part. Once dismissed, you hurry back to the rest of the B Company and try to slip back into the ranks like nothing happened. Some good-natured dribbling from the other boys tells you no hard feelings. Over the next few weeks, your training ratchets up more than you thought it would. Troops continue to pour in the sector. The trains don't even go to small Albert anymore, stopping instead at the much larger railhead town of Amiens, 10 miles back and everyone starts to sense that a big offensive is in the offing. You catch occasional glimpses of your bookseller captain, but otherwise work directly under your platoon lieutenant, and a couple of the sergeant's B company seems to be coming along well. The men are generally in high spirits, all things being equal, and with the hazard kept to a minimum, you'll be able to live a somewhat predictable and secure life. Nobody ever forgets there's a war on, of course, but for the most part, the fighting is being done somewhere else. One evening, a decidedly more titillating option presents itself. Another private who is billeted with you, Brown, announces he's going to sneak down to the red light. That's a local parlance for a whorehouse. Brown asks whether anyone else wants to join. A few men seem interested. Brown's excited. He turns to eagerly. How about it, Calvin? It'll be a good time. They know me there. I'll introduce you to the lass I'm going to marry when this is all through. Brown is genuinely smitten with one of the resident employees and seems to sincerely believe he and she will live happily ever after. Nobody's had the heart yet to tell him that she's only doing this for the money, that she's been with over a dozen other men from the B Company, or that she's promised to marry every last one of them. You fighting men are not the only ones forced to put your normal lives on hold and make the best of the awful predicament. Brown may be a regular down at the red light, but you're not. You've avoided this sort of thing so far, though this is the first time anybody asked you point blank to come. There's really no chance of being caught. You know the routines of everyone watching your company, and besides, the red light is hardly a secret, especially since there's slightly more upscale blue light for officers. The way the most men look at it, any of you could be dead tomorrow. You're going to have to spend your money somewhere in France, and nobody else in this country seems to like your soldiers nearly as much. A couple other men decide to join Brown. Their excitement is palpable. Well, Calvin, Brown says, his feet already heading for the door. What's it going to be? I'm out. There's somebody waiting for me back home, and I'm a man of honor. I might be in, but I'm not sure I have enough money. Or I'm in. If I'm going to die here, then at least I won't die happy. Uh, let's go with I'm out. I'm not really into this sort of things now, or I would be in the past. Probably a wise choice. Sorry lads, you say, but that's not for me. You'll have to have fun without me. They're already halfway out the door by the time you finish the sentence. They seem to have gotten over your refusal quite quickly. You can still hear their muffled laughter when a lance corporal comes upon you standing there alone. He looks at you, looks at the doorway through which Brown and the others just ran, then looks back at you. Sternly, he asks you a simple question. Where are those men off to, Private? No idea, sir. They're just heading off to afternoon services, sir. Brown and some others are going to Red White, sir. Probably just carrying out some orders, sir. Hmm... I don't want to get them caught. The service is not good. Let's go, probably just carrying some water, sir. You say something you know isn't true, but at least it's plausible. In your mind, that makes the lie almost a good thing. Like telling a dead man's grandmother that he talked about her all the time, when in fact he was always drunk. The lance corporal looks like he's in the mood to play along. 
Fair enough, he says. Hopefully those orders are something they can handle. They've heard that the orders can sometimes be a lot more difficult than young, excited Tommies might first reckon them to be, if you get my drift. He smiles an almost imperceptible smile. After an awkward moment of silence, the Lance Corporal speaks up again. Whatever your reasons, Private, it tells me something that you're the kind of man to pass up a trip to Red White with his mates. He doesn't seem to be complimenting you. Then he puts his finger to his chin, as though deep in thought. But since this man has never struck you as particularly thoughtful, you know it's just an act. Finally, he gives up the gig. You know, Calvin, I've just had a thought. How about we make you a stretcher bearer? B Company needs a few more, and it'd be a good fit. What say you? I think that's a good thing. A stretcher bearer. They do exactly what the name suggests. Since you haven't been in a show, you haven't seen them in action, but there are a few things you do know about stretcher bearers. One is that they don't get to shoot anyone. Another is that they carry these big collapsible stretchers out to the battlefield and then carry big heavy wounded men back to the regimental aid post somewhere in the rear, all the while hoping not to pip one themselves. And the third thing you know is that stretcher barrows tend to be made up of band members, volunteers and conscientious objectors. You'd be defining yourself a bit if you accepted the Lance Corporal's offer. Well, Calvin, what do you think? Time's a-wasting. If you're up to it, then let's get going. If you'd rather stay in infantry, then let's get back to barracks. On the double. Ah, you know what? Let's, let's try it. It seems like an interesting option. The Lance Corporal looks pleased. Good on you, he says with a smile. Then he tells you a bit more about the regimental history for this particular role. Hopefully I'll never see you in action. It's important work though, and dangerous too. I've been in France just under a year and I've lost track how many stretcher barrels we've gone through. Oh my god. They make an easy target for Jerry and he's usually a crack shot. Oh god. Now he tells me you think. Funny how that piece of information only came out after you volunteered. A slap on the back is the Lance Corporal's way of telling you that this is simply how it is, so best get used to the idea now. Then he sends you to the regimental medical officer to begin your new career. Fuck. <laughs> We're gonna die. Private Calvin. He doesn't say anything. Wait, what's next? Okay, he turns back. A doctor named McGuffin greets you. Well, he's a lieutenant and he's also a medical officer for the B Company. And he's got a Royal Army Medical Corps insignia on his cap. So you assume he's a doctor. He never tells you otherwise. Good to have a warm body, with an McGuffin says by way of greeting. You're the fourth stretcher bearer for B Company, so now we have a full complement again. The other three are just coming back from a kickabout, I think, so you can meet them momentarily. Then the man turns back to a book he's been reading. It would seem you have been dismissed. Fortunately, the other stretcher bearers ar arrive as promised. Man, this is a hard sentence to pronounce. Two of them you recognize from the marching band, the tuba player and the trumpeteer, but the third is a bloke you've never seen before, nor, frankly, does he carry himself like a soldier. There's something altogether civilian about him. That's Morgan, you hear Lieutenant McGuffin say behind you once he sees who you're looking at. An Irish conchi just got here yesterday. They sent him to us precisely so he'd be away from his countrymen, and I suppose they brought you in to balance out his stench. So Morgan here is a conscientious objector, or conchi, as McGuffin derisively calls him. That means a tribunal has certified him as being unfit for fighting duty, on account of some supposedly legitimate religious or personal conviction, and directed him instead to a non-combat role such as stretcher bearer. Of course, you think to yourself, McGuffin is right that makes perfect sense to put the Irish conchi far apart from his comrades. If you start mixing in loyalties like that, you're as good as asking for an insurrection. Hello there, a smiling, waving Morgan finally says once he sees you. Welcome to our little club, he continues in the same welcoming tone. You must be the new man for the infantry. Oh, from the infantry. Good to have you with us. 
That's Harris, the tuba player, and over there is Peterson, the trumpeteer. Harris and Peterson both give a quick wave, and then the group of you exchange handshakes. Morgan is as gentlemanly as gentlemanly can be. Then Morgan leans in and whispers directly to you, Apparently, I'm not to be trusted around here, an Irish conchie and all that. They seem to think that a strapping infantryman such as yourself will keep me in line. Morgan winks as he says, th says this, and then, in a voice loud enough for everyone can hear, Don't you be con concerning yourself over me, Private Calvin. I'll be a good boy. Well, great situation here. <laughs> He's gonna run away. <laughs> and we, we will have to stop him at one point. Or he gets shot immediately, I'm not sure what to expect. McGuffin walks over, the folded book nestled snugly under his arm, and gives you a little orientation lecture while the other stretcher bearers stand beside you. He explains that your duties are to be at the ready during any time of fighting, to rush to any wounded comrade at the earliest convenience and without undue regard for your own safety, and to administer first aid. Soldiers, McGuffin reminds you, are expected to continue their advance and to ignore fallen comrades. The wounded are your responsibility, not theirs. Since you are a stretcher bearer, your final and most important duty is to carry the wounded back to the nearest regimental aid post. Well, to carry them if they need to be carried. If the wounded can walk on their own, all the better. No matter how the wounded get to the rear, the field ambulance takes it from there and you head back out to the battlefield to start the process again hoping all the while that the company, oh, that the enemy doesn't make you a casualty yourself. <laughs> the company, that would be good, shooting in your own ranks. We've got four of you for B Company, McGuffin says, so there should be two teams working at all times. The stretchers are made up of two long poles attached to either side of a canvas sheet. One man holds the poles in the front and the other in the rear, with the wounded soldier lying on the canvas in between them. Hmm. You suddenly think to yourself, if there's four of us, then there are two groups of two. You look around again. Do you care who you're teamed with? No. No matter. It doesn't work that way anyway. This is not primary school recess. And besides, once the shooting starts, it'll become painful obvious that the muddy, broken landscape of the Soma battlefield means it's virtually impossible for just two men to carry a loaded stretcher anywhere. So yeah, we've been turned down in this chapter as a runner. I was wondering if I shouldn't go for a gunner, but now we're a stretcher bearer <laughs> doing the career. Now we're the unarmed target on the battlefield. I have a feeling, and I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, there was an unwritten rule that these guys shouldn't be shot at during the battle. But you know, if they're welcoming targets, they're welcoming targets. So what the hell do I know who will the Germans shoot at? So join me next time for the next chapter where we might finally venture on the battlefield and get killed. Yay!